It is said that a blade in the dark is worth a thousand swords at dawn. They are the masters of infiltration, stealth, and subterfuge. Today we talk about the rogue in Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. Greetings, scoundrels and thieves. My name is Monty Martin. And I am Kelly McLaughlin. And, and we, we are, are the Dungeon, Dungeon Dudes. Dudes. On today's episode, we're taking an in-depth look at the Rogue class from D&D 5th Edition. Yeah, we're going to take a look at everything you need to create your next Rogue for your campaign. We'll start with the ability scores, races, feats, as, and other build options that will help you prepare your rogue for any situation, whether it's a back alley brawl, a dungeon infiltration, or a courtly intrigue. We're also going to take a look at pop culture references from film, television, comic books, books, and even history to get you inspired about playing your rogue. And we've got lots of cool role-playing ideas and tips to help you flesh out your, your rogue's background and personality. The rogue is the quintessential stealthy scoundrel. Yeah, your character could be a master thief, a deadly assassin, a graceful acrobat, a tomb robber, or any other fantasy archetype from your favorite story or movie. No matter the way, all rogues believe that the world is theirs for the taking, but need to remember that curiosity killed the cat. So let's get rolling. Why would we want to play a rogue? Why wouldn't you want to play a rogue? They're sneaky, they're mean, and they can kill things with a lot of crazy moves and abilities. They are such a fun and versatile class. Um, they have the ability to deal single target damage with their, thanks to their amazing sneak attack ability. Yeah. Um, they get more skill proficiencies and tool proficiencies than any other class in the game. Especially with things like expertise and stuff like that. Exactly. Your skill bonuses are higher than virtually any other classes. Yeah. Um, right out the gate. The other really big advantage, I think, for rogues, and especially for new players, is that they encourage a lot of creative thinking about situations, um, especially because there's no resource management in the class whatsoever. Almost everything in the base class, outside of archetypes, is a usable completely at will, so there's no bookkeeping to worry about. You always know that you can use your best abilities whenever you need to, although some of them have specific requirements and situational uses. So that makes them really easy to manage, but really fun to role play. Exactly, which is kind of a killer combination. I think that's probably why they're such a popular class, in addition to the fact that they embody so many of our favorite archetypes and i think that some of the most well-loved characters in fiction and fantasy uh, are rogues because we love the killer for hire or the scoundrel with a heart of gold yeah so what role does the rogue play in the party i think that there's three different roles that every rogue ends up uh filling in an adventuring party uh, the first, right off the bat, is going to be that single target damage dealer. Yeah, they're not there to clean out an entire room full of enemies, but they, they pick the biggest enemy in the room, or the one that needs to die the fastest, and they say, that's my target, and they get to kill in it. Exactly, and depending on your choice of archetype, uh, your sneak attack can be anything from a really nice hit to a one-shot kill. Um, beyond that, every single rogue um, is an amazing skill specialist, that is often depended on by the party to be the scout, to disarm traps, uh, and they might even be the party face, depending on how many social skills your rogue invests in. Yeah, but they, they do have that skill set to be the key infiltrator. Uh, they're usually the ones that get sent ahead of the party. They're the ones that yeah. have, to, have to do all that work, uh, which is really fun for role-playing, but also very valuable for the party. I think the biggest weakness, though, of the rogue is that oftentimes they want to be doing things off on their own. And this means that a rogue does not have a lot of toughness innately. They have a lot of wily ways about getting out of dangerous situations, but it's very easy to get overconfident as a rogue and end up in over your head and then end up dead. Yeah, just because you're a sneaky rogue doesn't mean you should split the party. Now, if we want to get inspired to create our rogue, we have a veritable rogues gallery of inspiration to choose from. 
<laughs> oh, you just love saying that. I just, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's so many ways to get inspired about your rogue in, in so many different places. Yeah, I think um, because much like the fighter is the archetypal big damn hero, the rogue is another archetype that comes up in almost every mythology and fantasy story right from the get-go. The trickster, um, the infiltrator, the liar, the scoundrel, the thief. We love these types of characters in our in our fantasy, and you can find them almost anywhere. But the, we've got some of our favorites. They always use they, they always usually fall uh, to be like second character to the lead, but everybody seems to gravitate towards that character anyway. Yeah. Um, one of my favorite examples, as you put it, is every movie that has Harrison Ford in it. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, I, I think that Han Solo is the first character that everyone thinks of, of the scoundrel rogue who ultimately has a heart of gold. Uh, he doesn't really display a lot of uh, good stealthiness in the movie. He actually fails a lot with his stealth. <laughs> he, he does. But as in terms of role playing and in terms of personality and, and like the just the way he presents himself, uh, he is the scoundrel. Yeah, and even when he plays a character like Indiana Jones, who I would also say is pretty roguish in the way that he behaves, kind of embodying not the um, necessarily sneaky, stealthy, but the really cerebral and intelligent rogue uh, who's great with dealing with traps, exploring environments, uh, and actually being a rather knowledgeable character as well. Great one from video games is Nathan Drake from uh, the popular Uncharted series. Yeah, um, I think that uh, those games, again, if you want to live the Indiana Jones yourself firsthand, uh, Nathan Drake is a perfect example. Straight up, I think one of my favorite rogue characters uh, that's emerging in fiction right now on TV is Arya Stark. Arya Stark, uh, every episode that she's in of Game of, Thro Game of Thrones, the longer I watch the show, the more I get excited about her being a rogue. And she just keeps getting better. Like, I can see her leveling up through yeah. the show. I actually love Arya Stark as an example because she's such a great starting point for the backstory of a rogue. Like, so many characters in fiction, so many rogues that we see play in game, we never get to see them growing up in the streets or falling in with the mysterious Assassin's Guild and learning these weird skills. So she's a really great example of thinking about what you're... you're character did before they became an adventurer uh and also spoiler alert um what the repercussions of who you turn your back on might be uh, what about um what about carmen san diego i love that show i love Car the, the whole mythos of carmen san diego of being like the international thief that will steal anything right uh i love this idea of playing a rogue who is all about the heist yeah Right, um, and that is totally on board to steal the most absurd things ever. If we want to look at comic books, uh, we also have Star Lord is another cool example of a rogue, and of course Catwoman as Selena Kyle. Catwoman is a phenomenal uh, rogue, like through and through. Yeah, straight up, ultimately played straight. Also has that femme fatale angle as well that many rogues have. You can be the seductress as well as being the thief. Um, and, of course, Black Widow, uh, if you want to um, have, again, that really complex backstory and complex motivations behind why your character fights for different sides. Also, if you want to talk about uh, Catwoman and Black Widow, you have the perfect examples of uh, the thief and the assassin. Yes, Exactly, and a very clear difference. Although I think that probably both characters, depending on which comic book you're reading, have shifted yeah. across, across both of those as well. Um, going for our, our great Disney example, I think Aladdin is probably a rogue as well. Yeah. Uh, certainly, um, uh, the, the Arabian Nights saga has so many great examples of thieves and rogues, characters like the, the 40 Thieves, uh, and Alibaba, and all of those great uh, myths uh, and legends that can really inspire uh, the, where the origins of the rogue come from as that trickster character. Um, I think one of the best examples, we always like to include a Lord of the Rings example when we can, uh, Bilbo Baggins is actually a great rogue. Yeah, ultimately, 
uh, even though he's a reluctant hero at first, I think a lot of what Bilbo Baggins does uh, have really inspired uh, the rogue character. Um, I think the other one that I would be completely uh, remiss to not mention um, is uh, Cudgel the Clever from Jack Vance's A Dying Earth. And his adventures are pretty much the reason why we have the rogue class in Dungeons and Dragons. Um, that combined with probably Bilbo Baggins are the, the instigators of this whole mess. So now that we've talked about some of the inspiration, let's talk about building your rogue. There's a lot of great options here. Um, and like we said earlier, you don't have to do a lot of management with them, but you do have to make some pretty key choices. Yeah, the rogue's an interesting class because unlike many classes that have lots of choices every time you level up, I think a rogue only has a few really key decisions to make early on in their career. And everything else from that is giving you tools that are making you better at being creative in play. So if you're the type of person that really doesn't want to worry about a lot of bookkeeping, both out of game when you level up your character uh, and just managing stuff on your character sheet in play, a rogue is really a perfect choice because mechanically the class is going to get more out of your own creativity about using what you have than the big choices that you have to make in character building. Yeah, so the first thing that we're going to talk about is ability scores. And for most rogues, I'm going to go ahead and say it's dexterity. Absolutely. If you look at the rogue skill list, if you look at their fighting styles um, and everything else, it all points you towards being a fast and agile, dexterous character. And this should be your highest ability score. And that doesn't just um, include shooting with a bow, but also like the finesse weapons. If you do want to be a close range rogue, mm -hmm. uh, you're going to be using finesse weapons more likely than not. The other big thing is that dexterity is just such a powerful stat because it also improves your armor class in light armor and gives you a higher initiative bonus. Uh, many rogues really want to make that first strike in combat to take the biggest advantage possible. Uh, so having that very high dexterity score out the gate and continuing to improve that is going to be the most important thing you can do for your rogue. What other ability scores would we look at beyond dexterity? I think at this point... Um, with your rogue, it's really going to depend on how you want to roleplay your character, which makes the rogue very interesting because, well, there's a lot of mechanical benefits from each ability score from here, it's really going to depend on how you imagine your rogue. Some people are going to want to play a very social character, and they're going to want to invest in the social skills, so you'll want to improve your charisma. But um, just like we talked about how Indiana Jones is a, is a smart rogue, Intelligence can actually play a big part of being a roguish character too, just as wisdom can be as well. If you want to be a scout, be very perceptive. I was going to say wisdom because a lot of people rely on the rogue for that uh, initial perception uh, mm. to not only detect traps, enemies, all sorts of things. Yeah, so I find it's really hard to say which of these is the strongest because it's really going to come down to the play style of both your campaign uh, and uh, what, where do you want to go with the character? I think that if you're looking at a classic dungeon crawler exploration, I think wisdom is going to be your preference. Yeah. But if you're expecting more of a social campaign, I would lean more towards charisma. With intelligence being probably the... If you want to do the Cerebral Rogue, do it. But it's probably the least compelling outside of role-playing choices. Um, similarly, uh, I think that your strength score is also one that is not terribly important. Um, what about constitution? Well... I mean, the idea of a rogue is to not get hit. Yeah, I think that, you know, your constitution's not going to matter until it matters a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about some of the races that work best as a rogue. Um, I, I would immediately say any elves... Yeah, all three of the elves, uh, because incidentally, each of the elves gets either a charisma, intelligence, or a wisdom boost, as well as, as the well dexterity. as the plus two dexterity bonus. So I think that um, all three of the rogues, whether it's the the wood elf, the high elf, or the dark elf, the drow, um, are going to give lots and lots of great role playing opportunities, lots of different styles between all of them, uh, and. All of them come with extra weapon training, 
either a little bit of extra magic as well, and really cool benefits that are just going to make your rogue a little bit more versatile. Some of them also have benefits to stealth as well, with uh, the Wood Elves' ability to hide in natural terrain thanks to the uh, Mask of the Wild ability. Yeah. yeah. What about um, Halflings? Halflings as well are the perennial favorite, I think. Like, it, there's nothing more classic than the Halfling Rogue. I think that's why the D&D starter set always makes the Halfling the Rogue. <laughs> yeah. Right? Um, and again, uh, as a Halfling, you've got your choice of a Constitution or um, Charisma Boost, depending on whether you're Strongheart or Lightfoot. You have the naturally stealthy ability, so you can hide behind larger creatures than yourself. And again, a plus two dexterity. Uh, and you know what? That halfling luck thing, man. <laughs> halfling luck is always, always Once helpful. in a while as a rogue, you're going to roll a one, and you are going to love that you have that lucky trait, because it will save your butt. Um, we, also, we, all, we always talk about the variant human, uh, which is a great choice here. But one thing to keep in mind is the rogue doesn't need feats the way some of the other classes can really benefit from them. But that's still... There are some cool ones to pick, and picking the variant human can be really helpful. Yeah, it's unlike other classes that really want to have a feat out the gate, I don't think it's important as important for the, the rogue. You also get an extra skill as a variant human, but that's something that both the elves get because they get the perception skill automatically, as well as um, other races like half-elves also get that, in addition to a whole other bunch of things. The other thing that makes humans and uh, halflings in particular less exciting than elves that can't be understated is humans do not have dark vision. Um, and choosing a race with dark vision is a gigantic advantage um, when it comes to being stealthy, especially if you're fighting regular humans. Right? Yeah. Being a, uh, the advantages of darkness are huge, and time and time again, you play a human rogue. It's like, I want to hide in the dark. Well, you can't see either. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you did mention half-elves as well. Yeah, I think that they're a pretty solid choice. Yeah. Right? Uh, especially for a social rogue. Um, the There's nothing bad about them, and I think that the case could be made for them. Um, you could also, if you've got Volo's Guide to Monsters, uh, consider both the Tabaxi and the Kenku make fantastic non-standard rogues. The Kenku's mimicry ability is actually really cool in, in certain types of social and stealth situations. I, I would love to roleplay a Kenku yeah. rogue. It just seems so cool. Yeah, And we've had a tabaxi rogue at our table uh, uh, who uh, lived by that uh, code of curiosity killed the cat. Uh, but um, the speed bonus from the tabaxi oh, yeah. is huge for getting in and getting out as a rogue. Really, really handy. So if you look at the proficiencies of the rogue, it kind of steers you towards that dexterity-based class as well, because you get um, like crossbows and some finesse weapons like the rapier. And the short sword and all other simple weapons and hand crossbows. Yeah. So the rogue is kind of weird because you don't get everything in the martial weapon category, but you get everything you want. <laughs> Yeah. Anyways, if yeah. You, if you're taking that dexterity, it gives you the weapons that you would be using anyway. Yeah. The only one you don't get, actually, is the longbow. Uh, and that makes the elves really compelling because they get the longbow proficiency if you want that bigger damage die. Right? Um, but I think a lot of rogues are going to like the style of the crossbow. Right? Yeah. Um, you also are proficient in dexterity saving throws Which as well key. as intelligence saving throws. Um, and as you once you level up, you'll get the Slippery Mind ability, and you'll actually have proficiency in Wisdom saving throws as well. Um, I don't think as a rogue your saving throws are going to be stellar. Um, the one thing you're going to be very, very good at is dodging fireballs. Yeah. Um, but everything else you really want to watch out for it. As a rogue, you have a gigantic selection of skill proficiencies. Probably the most permissive one of any class in the game. Because you get to choose your choice of four skills right out the gate. And then on top of that, later we're going to talk about expertise, which ups those even more. Yeah. But uh, if you are looking at proficiencies to take, I mean, you should probably take stealth. Yeah, and you're probably going to want to pick up acrobatics as well, because it's a natural complement to that. Yeah. Um, I think most rogues are going to want to take perception so they can both locate the traps as well as disarm them. Uh, and all rogues are also proficient in thieves' tools. So you're going to have that right out the gate that you're expected to be the one that disarms traps and opens locks. 
Um, I think as a rogue, the more interesting choice is not what skills you have, but what ones you don't have. Because sometimes, uh, more often than not, um, I find that people turn to the rogue and be like, hey, rogue, can you intimidate this guy? And the rogue's like, I don't have proficiency in intimidate. I have deception. Yeah, I can lie, but I, yeah. can't, I can't be scary. And I think deception is going to be the favorite one as well. So I think you're probably, right off the bat, almost every rogue is going to take perception, deception, stealth, and um, acrobatics. And then you've got your background to pick up another couple and a few more if you get those from your race. And I think that you kind of want to amass all these skills and just be able to do everything. <laughs> Let's discuss some of the really cool things that rogues can do. Uh, we'll start with expertise. Yeah, uh, this one connects right back to your skill proficiencies because um, you, at first level, you get to choose two skills that you double your proficiency modifier in. And as you level up, you'll get to choose two more. Uh, so this means that in total, you'll have four skills that when you make your skill checks using them, uh, your proficiency bonus is doubled. Yeah, and it's it's ridiculous to have double proficiency in something like stealth. Uh, that just makes you really, really sneaky. Like even I don't think low... I've seen a single rogue that doesn't choose stealth as yeah, one of their expertise. Yeah, that's the, I mean, it should be your expertise. If you're planning on playing a rogue, you're going to be sneaky. Um, but getting, like, early on in the, in the game, you're getting, like, a plus six or a plus eight mm -hmm. to your stealth um, at very early levels. So Yeah, I think the, the reason why you want to choose skills like stealth and deception is because um, stealth and deception are skills that are opposed to another creature's insight or perception check, which means that you're rolling the dice against someone else's dice. And that's where the double benefit really helps if you get a bad roll, because they still need to get a really good roll to beat you. Whereas with other uh, other ability checks, you know, the um, you can do those things more reliably, but it really is like things like deception and stealth that I think that having expertise in is really, really useful in. Um, would you choose these tools as an expertise? Uh, depends on the campaign. If, if, if I feel like it's going to come up a lot, uh, some campaigns, like I, I rarely use these tools or see them come yeah. up. But other ones, there's like trap dungeons and like all sorts of things that you might be able to use the thieves tools for picking mm -hmm. a lot of locks uh, if that's kind of the way that you're going to go then then yeah it might be beneficial i think that if you're going to choose the thieves tools to disarm the trap you probably also want to think about choosing perception and investigation because all the expertise in the world isn't going to help you if you can't find the trap so probably the most famous ability that the rogue has is the sneak attack. Sneak attack! <laughs> Nothing feels better than getting that sneak attack and just being able to roll some extra dice. A fistful of dice. A fistful of dice just yeah. to know how cool you were in your attack. It's probably one of the most awesome feeling abilities in the game, especially when it happens. Um, so how sneak attack works is once on your turn... Um, you can roll extra damage against a creature, provided you have advantage on the attack roll. Um, alternatively, if you don't have advantage on the attack roll, but another creature who's an enemy of the creature you're targeting is within five feet of it and not incapacitated, you can also apply your extra sneak attack damage. The amount of sneak attack damage that you get is directly related to your rogue's level, which basically improves uh, by 1d6 on every odd level. So if you're a 7th level rogue, you have a 4d6 sneak attack. Um, and if you're a 1st level rogue, you just have one extra die. And I know that uh, once upon a time, as a, as a new player, uh, one of the first characters I ever played was a rogue. And uh, Monty made me a nice little flowchart uh, to tell me when I could use sneak attack and when I couldn't. Yeah, it's pretty step by step. Um, but I find a lot of new rogues and new players in general get really confused by all these requirements because even just saying it out loud is a giant mouthful, right? Um, but in practice, there's a few really key checks and balances that you need to make sure of. The first thing that you need to always be doing uh, to sneak attack is you need to be wielding a finesse weapon or a ranged weapon. Um, the next step is you must have advantage on the attack roll. Um, if you don't have advantage on the attack roll, you can still apply your sneak attack damage, provided you don't have disadvantage, and another creature who's an enemy 
of whoever you're sneak attacking is within five feet of them. This applies for both even if you're making a melee attack or a ranged attack as long as there's an enemy of the target within five feet of it. This means that the rogue works really well uh, in a team scenario where you have the fighter or the paladin or somebody who can run up and engage the enemy, yeah. allowing the rogue to then step back and get those sneak attacks off to finish off those enemies. And I will say, so sneak attack is one of those abilities that is quite permissive. Um, and in general, as long as the rogue is working with their t party members or teammates or creating an advantageous situation, they will be able to reliably sneak attack almost every single turn. Um, in fact, you, you really have to be at a disadvantaged situation to not find a way of getting that to happen. Either your allies aren't helping you out or you truly are on your own. It can be sometimes surprising for DMs that oh man, this sneak attack ability is happening every single turn. But yeah, it usually does. <laughs> An important thing to remember is that sneak attack can only happen once per turn. Even if you eventually get an ability that allows you to attack twice or anything like that, you still only get sneak attack one time per turn. That said, dual wielding can still be a good idea because it gives you two opportunities to land that sneak attack if you're fighting an opponent with a high armor class. Uh, and the absolute icing on the cake of sneak attack is its damage is multiplied by a critical hit. So if you do score a crit um, with your sneak attack, you pick up all those dice and roll them twice or double them however your uh, specific group does critical hits. It does apply a lot of extra damage, which makes all those other abilities uh, like assassinate and the roguish archetype features really, really scary. Yeah, if you can assassinate, which does mean that you get sneak attack, that's gonna be a pretty deadly yeah. hit. Uh, and I will say as well to that, that some of the roguish archetypes gain additional circumstances under which they can apply their sneak attack. So this is a general rule of thumb, and we're going to include um, a little uh, handout that you can download in the links below uh, so that if you have a rogue that's still not understanding it, you can print them out based on what Kelly used in one of our campaigns. How about that cutting action? I think that's another favorite ability that you get pretty early on as well for a rogue. Yeah, it's it's incredible because it, it kind of frees up your action to do the stealth kills that you want to do and gives you the ability to um, do a bunch of other stuff on your turn. Mm -hmm. I think my favorite example of it is using it to disengage when you're at short range. So you can move in, attack, disengage, and move out, provided you have enough movement left over. It lets you get into the melee and get out safely. But also just using it to dash means that a rogue's speed is twice as much as it always is at any time. So you can really um, either catch someone that's running away or keep the distance on them. But probably the most interesting use is using that bonus action to hide. Yeah, because um, as we described earlier, um, being able to, to hide is uh, very beneficial for you getting that sneak attack and all mm -hmm. of that. So if you can find a way in combat to attack, move, use your bonus action to hide, then on the next turn, if you were successful in doing so, you can get another sneak attack. Yeah. However, bear in mind that the rules for stealth uh, require that you must be completely hidden. Uh, that means that a foe cannot draw a line of sight for, to you in order for you to hide. Um, fortunately, we've also got a great video on uh, the rules for stealth, uh, so you can check that out as well if you need to figure out exactly how you can hide the best advantage in combat. So the roguish archetype is one of the choices you're going to have to make at level 3, uh, which is pretty early on in the game, and it's going to define what kind of rogue you want to be. Yeah, um, there's three choices uh, of archetype uh, in the player's handbook, which are the arcane trickster, the assassin, and the thief. Uh, and Xanathar's Guide to Everything has four, yeah. uh, which are the Mastermind, the Inquisitive, the Swashbuckler, and the Scout. Um, in my experience, I'm often surprised when someone doesn't choose the Assassin. It's, it's kind of the go-to choice. There are benefits of all of them, and I've always looked at some of the other ones to be like, would this be cool? Um, but I tend to go back to the Assassin a lot. Well, I think that the reason why is because people, the, 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 let's talk about the assassin first because we should yeah. just say, so people choose the assassin because they see that you get to automatically crit any creature that you have uh, surprised and they lose their minds at how 
good this ability. Seems like it is on paper. After that ability, which assassins get right out the gate, mm -hmm. the assassin archetype doesn't get much else that is truly amazing uh, until very, very high levels. One thing to keep in mind is that the surprise option is not going to present itself that often unless you're really, really good and your party's really, really good at figuring that out. But uh, mm -hmm. generally speaking, you're not going to get to assassinate all the time. Uh, it is still a very powerful ability, and if you want to play that rogue that has the potential of one-hit killing some big monster, uh, the assassinate ability is going to be your best ticket to do that. I think it really stands in contrast to other classes like the Arcane Trickster, because as an Arcane Trickster, you're going to get a small selection of magical spells from the schools of illusion and enchantment, which are really going to change the way your character plays. Mm -hmm. um, whereas the assassin is all about getting that one giant hit. You have all these cool abilities that you can use as an arcane trickster later on in the fight. You gotta decide, really, before you just write all the other archetypes off and go for the assassin, just how often that ability is actually gonna come up in play. Because it's not as often as it seems like it will be on paper. And what about the thief? What's the thief really gain benefits from? I think the thief kind of gets a bad rap because the thief gets to expand their options for um, cunning action, which is something that's going to come up all the time, right? They get a lot of great boost to their mobility as well as a result, but they kind of do seem like the most bland. I think the arcane trickster is personally my favorite because anytime I see spell casting with illusion magic means, oh, that means my rogue can know misty step and invisibility. Pretty awesome. Uh, yeah. That's going to help out a lot. So, yeah. I, yeah, a lot of people don't look at the Arcane Trickster. They don't really make it past Assassin when they're reading about it. But yeah. Yeah, there's some cool I think things. the Arcane, the, like, you look at the Assassin and you go, okay, I get this amazing sneak attack on the first round of combat. Uh, but then you compare that to the uh, Arcane Trickster, who actually can cast invisibility on themselves and reliably set up the conditions to get another sneak attack off either in combat or escape. Yeah, I, I also do think that these uh, Xanathar's Guide options, and uh, some of them were relayed from um, uh, the Sword Coast Adventures Guide. Yeah. Uh, there are some really cool ones in there. One that actually has caught my attention, uh, the Swashbuckler, I actually really enjoy. Yeah, the Swashbuckler is really cool because um, it allows you to sneak attack someone that is just in melee with you. Yeah. So if it's only you and the creature adjacent to each other, you can still use your sneak attack against them, which can be pretty handy, especially if um, if you're rolling up a rogue and you go around the table and your party member's like, I want to play a wizard. I want to play a ranged ranger. I want to play a sorcerer. I want to play a warlock. And you realize you're the only person that's going to be interested in fighting in melee combat. Might be worth choosing. I really like the scout just because it's kind of this interesting bridge to the ranger. Um, it gives you a lot, lots of actually really useful abilities in wilderness exploration, whereas the thief might be more of the dungeon delver expert. Um, the other two, the uh, mastermind and what's the other one? The inquisitive. The inquisitive. Both are very interesting to me, but I think that it's like a niche uh, type of campaign that you might be looking at. The Mastermind lets you use the help action as a bonus, as your kind of which, action. Which is pretty amazing. Which is really, really useful for setting up, a, like, kind of feeling like you're a leader. I think the Xanathar in Xanathar's Guide to Everything says that he would be a Mastermind. <laughs> I think the roguish archetypes are a pretty small part of your packet, and all of them come with pretty niche abilities that it's worth talking to your DM about the sort of campaign you're going to be playing. Because I think that uh, the definitely campaigns with more of a political or social focus are really going to favor ones like the Arcane Trickster, the Mastermind, and the Inquisitive. Whereas exploration campaigns are going to make the, um, the Scout and the Thief much stronger. Um, and you really have to be playing a combat-heavy campaign for the Assassin to be the number one pick, in my opinion. Uh, whereas the Arcane Trickster... I, I'm biased. I love the Arcane Trickster. <laughs> so when we're figuring out how to roleplay our rogue, what are some of the questions we need to ask? Well, the rogue is so diverse, right? Because if you want to be that gruff, mysterious guy that pulls up their hood and sits in the corner of the bar and speaks in the gruff voice, 
and it only is motivated by money. You can play that way. Yeah, but there are a lot of other options as well. And actually, one of my favorite things that we were discussing um, before we shot this uh, video is um, talking about Han Solo as the rogue and how he's he's not a lone wolf. He, he kind of comes off as a lone wolf. Yeah, but he's not at all. No. Because he's got a best friend. Yeah, and right? he, he would never, ever betray that best friend. And I think that's really important is uh, rogues being, um, you know, doesn't trust anybody. But the people that they do end up trusting... They stick with for life. And like once you're mm -hmm. friends with a rogue, that's going to go a long way. Yeah. A lot of players want to play a rogue, and they might take that as an invitation to steal from their party members or lie to their party members. If you want to play D&D &D that way, thumbs up. Like, go for it. But play, just because you're a rogue doesn't mean that you have to steal from your party members. Um, and in fact, you probably want to not do that if you want to keep your friends. Yeah, and also, I mean, it's a, it's a team-based game, so, I mean, if other people at the table are saying, like, hey, I would like to not be stolen from or backstabbed or lied to, uh, mm -hmm. then there are other options to still play that gruff, mean rogue and, uh, yeah. you know, have a close group of friends that you're like, I would do anything for these guys, but everybody else, you're going to die. But, I mean, that's the interesting thing, is that, like, every rogue in fiction deals with that tension and that's always an interesting character arc but you always see how like the roguish character has to deal with the fact that the party doesn't trust them and then they either have to break that trust and regain it or um really figure out how to prove themselves to the rest of the group that they can be that asset or something has to happen like there's always a bit of character development and i think that if you're just playing your rogue as this one note character that's like i just want to steal from everybody no matter what you're really missing out on the opportunity to embrace the ways that rogues in fiction develop and that's why we love those characters like han solo's turning point is that he comes back right yeah um every rogue comes back they have that like oh my god i'm not i need to support these people that believe in me in some way or that find that cause and your rogue needs to be like what is your cause what is the thing that's going to motivate you right um is it money is it a pretty face uh is there some sort of principle that your character realizes oh this is actually important to me um maybe it's revenge right what about backgrounds? There's a lot of good backgrounds for rogues as well. Yeah, I think that the rogue is really cool because you can actually roll a die and get stuck with whatever background you end up with. and It could see, work. And that could work as a rogue. I think everyone's like, I want to choose criminal. I mean, I actually tend to lean more towards the charlatan when I play my rogues. Yeah. Uh, but criminal, charlatan, you could even be like a hermit. You could be a folk hero. What about a noble? What about a noble? Noble who's actually a, a sneaky thief. I can think of a lot of great archetypes of how a noble person would actually be a rogue. Uh, especially... Uh, Batman? Uh, uh, well, rogue, noble, swashbuckler. Rogue, noble, swashbuckler. Yeah, right? Give and take all the insults. A rogue that learned... Like, they were trained in fencing, right? In their castle. So that's where they get all their, their skills from. But, like, they spent some time in the seedier side of society, and they're out to make a profit. What if your rogue was a sage? What would it mean for a rogue to come from a scholarly background? Well, there's Indiana Jones. Urchin is another, like, classic yeah. uh, type, right? We, when we also think about iconic rogues, they all have, like, a weird flaw. And it usually is something related to either greed or lust. Yeah. <laughs> And playing into those flaws is actually, in, in my opinion, what makes the rogue such such a unique character in almost all fiction that we that yeah. we see. Is uh, they always play into their flaws and they always end up overcoming them. Uh, but some of my favorite stories are um, are rogues that have played into their flaws, and that yeah. always creates a very dynam dynamic and interesting role play opportunity. I'm thinking of the, those circumstances where, like, the the rogue is totally enamored by. Uh, a pretty face, yeah. right? And they will do anything for the man or woman that they've set their eye on to. And that's it. Now, like, I, I think in a lot of ways you think of um, Star-Lord was trying to get away with, with it. Like, a rogue that's trying to get laid will go to any lengths. As well, so will a rogue that's trying to get paid. It rhymes.
I one of my favorite stories for for a rogue playing into its uh, weaknesses is um, a character that actually played a rogue in one of the games I was DMing uh, was in the middle of a boss battle and somebody cast hold monster on the boss and then it was the rogue's turn and rather than do anything useful he ran to the statue behind the boss to start grabbing diamonds out of the eyes which then <laughs> triggered a trap. Um, yeah. But I gave him an inspiration point because there was nothing better than the wizard being like, okay, I've got it held. What are you going to do now? And the rogue going, I'm going to go steal that stuff right over there. That's what I'm going to do mm -hmm. because that's what I'm after. I like shiny things. I could just see a rogue that was like loved good food and wine. Like an alcoholic rogue would be another one. Jack Sparrow is all about the rum, right? Yeah. Um, another, Why's the rum gone? Yeah, you know? exactly. Like, just they just want to get another drink, right? Or, or they just want to get out of here so they can have another cigarette or something like really, really mundane, right? Um, and all those are going to give you great um, opportunities to just not screw over the party, but escalate the situation in an interesting way. And yeah. I, I, and I think as a rogue that that you the coolest way to role play a rogue is to fight the balance between being overly cautious and being stupidly brave because you're greedy. So this has been our guide to the rogue in Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. We hope that you feel inspired and that you're ready to go sneak attack some bad guys. And of course, please tell us about your rogue in the comments below, whether you've got a great story, some build tips or ideas that you think we missed in this episode, or even just some great role-playing ideas to inspire other people, please share that with us below. And if you want to learn more about stealth, we do have a video on that right over here. Rogues are all about their actions as well, so check out our video guide to actions in combat right over here. Please subscribe to the channel so that you never miss an episode. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time in, in the, the dungeon. dungeon.